This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I would like to welcome you to a special one-week series on the intersection of King Arthur and his roundtable and compliance. The month of August 2018 has been the anniversary of my 1,000th podcast. Over this month, I have been putting on special one-week series on the intersection of compliance and topics. We've taken a look at Sherlock Holmes. We've taken a look at Shakespeare. We've taken a look at ethical culture. And we've considered considered the future of internal audit, analytics, and compliance. So as part of this special series, I'm going to take a look at one of my favorite characters in literature, King Arthur, and how King Arthur can inform your compliance program. This special series, King Arthur, His Roundtable and Compliance, is a special series of the Compliance Podcast Network. Part 5, The Quest for the Holy Grail and the Compliance Defense. In this final episode of my five-part exploration of the intersection of King Arthur, His Roundtable, and Compliance, I would like to conclude with the Holy Grail. What was the Holy Grail? According to Professor Dorsey Armstrong in her teaching company lecture series entitled King Arthur History and Legend, the Holy Grail has taken various forms over the years. For one, a fancy serving dish. For von Eisenbach, a magical stone. For Baron, de Baron, it is the cup that Christ drank from at the Last Supper. And of course, for Monty Python, it is a comedy sketch that no one ever finds. For the modern-day author Dan Brown, it is a person who is a descendant of Mary Magdalene and a bloodline which leads to the Merovingian kings of France. In other words, it means many things to many people. One of the articulated reasons for the creation of King Arthur's Round Table was tied to the Holy Grail. Since it was allegedly used at the Last Supper, it only seems natural that Arthur would seek it from his table as well. Indeed, in De Baron's account of Arthur, the wizard Merlin tells Arthur the round table was established to identify the one knight who was pure of heart and could find the Holy Grail. Only after a great quest for and the locating of the Holy Grail was achieved could Arthur's ambitions come to pass. Another interesting twist on the Holy Grail legend is that it was from Britain. Curiously, it was first discovered by some enterprising monks in Glastonbury, England, in the late 12th century. I would note Glastonbury is still using people, uh, uh, using uh, tourist traps to drag people in, i.e. Glastonbury Festival. They just happened to come across a well that bled water around the time of the annual pilgrimage. Going viral in the Middle Ages was tough, but the monks built upon their initial find by claiming that both King Arthur and his queen Guinevere were also buried at their abbey. Do you believe any of the above? Have you attended the Glastonbury Festival? Or you are on your own grail grail quest, whatever that dreamy quest might be. I thought about the Holy Grail quest in the context for the always interesting call for a compliance defense addition to the FCPA, which would give companies a full pass, even if they had sustained an FCPA violation. I see this quest for a compliance defense for companies that violate the FCPA to be as quixotic as the quest for the Holy Grail. As there were two requirements for the knight who was destined to find the the Grail, we will begin with pureness of heart. Recognizing that it might be difficult to find a corporation that is, quote, pure of heart, end quote, the appropriate analogy might be more simply spending what appears to be a large dollar amount on a compliance program. This is because it is not the amount you spend that informs the effectiveness of your compliance program. In the past five years, Walmart has reported that it spent over $900 million on its compliance program. The FCPA was enacted into existence in 1977. What do you get if you divide $900 million over 40 years? My basic math tells me that comes out to approximately $22.5 million a year. How many billions of dollars of revenue per year was the Walmart making during that time? I will leave that question for you to ascertain the answer to. Moving our quest 
time frame to the modern era of FCPA enforcement to say 2005, if one looks to the company's revenues from the middle of the last 10 years, for fiscal year ending January 31, 2016, Walmart reported a net income of $15.4 billion on $422 billion in gross sales. Now, what do you think about Walmart's quest for an effective compliance program based upon three years spending of $900 million being significant? Indeed, what is the percentage of its revenues over the past three years that Walmart spent creating its compliance program? Alas, my trial lawyer math skills do not allow me to calculate that number. How about the second part of the grail quest, uh, being a chaste knight? Once again, it is somewhat difficult to understand how a corporation could be chaste, but I think the appropriate analogy is of doing compliance. Put another way, it is not having a compliance program in place, but having an effective compliance program, and indeed an operationalized compliance program. Not only does the amount of money a company spends become immaterial to our quest, but the, also the same can be said to the claim that having a written program should entitle you to some defense to any FCPA violations. Just as questing for the Holy Grail is seeking something that does not exist, affording companies an offense from their own FCPA violations by having a written program in place is not a temporal reality. However, it was a 2017 FCPA corporate enforcement pro policy which sounded the death knell once and for all of the call for a compliance defense. The protocol set up by the DOJ is certainly creative and perhaps even unique in federal criminal law enforcement. The enforcement aspects, coupled with incentives provided to corporations and the detailing of best practices, are much more comprehensive to advance compliance than any argument for a compliance defense. And considering the new policy, most practitioners have started with the presumption that if a company meets the requirements under the FCPA, they will receive a declination. There are, that was certainly the true of the Dun and Bradstreet declination. There are a variety of factors present in the FCPA enforcement action which would lead the DOJ to make this blanket offer. As stated in the new policy, the investigation and prosecution of particular allegations of violations of the FCPA will raise complex enforcement problems abroad, as well as difficult issues of jurisdiction and statutory construction. Those who advocate a compliance defense argue it will somehow drive more compliance. Of course, they have never had any, as in zero, evidence to back up this claim. The structural problem with the compliance defense is simply that a paper program to give companies cover as they look the other way while their employees engage in bribery and corruption. It is designed to be a wink-wink, we told you not to do it, but we really want you to do it because we really want the money. Companies would then claim the FCPA violation is all those, quote, rogue, end quote, employees out there, and a company certainly cannot be expected to control its own workforce. The compliance defense is designed neither to encourage the doing of compliance nor operationalizing compliance in a company. It is simply designed to give companies a way to argue the DOJ to the DOJ. It's not our responsibility for our employees engaging in legal violations while not moving forward at all in the international fight against bribery and corruption. Perhaps the most basic misunderstanding of those advocating the compliance defense is that there is there is simply a binary choice to be made. Us versus them, guilty versus not guilty, conviction at trial versus no conviction at trial. They fail to understand the underpinnings of FCPA enforcement have always held a much broader view. It was true at the time of the FCPA's enactment in 1977 and is even more true today. The new policy recognizes the unusual nature of the international fight against bribery and corruption. George Telwiger writing in the FCPA blog, said, the new policy is grounded in the notion that companies in the government have a shared interest in securing the rule of law, which in the, this context includes gov global commercial markets freed from the influence and corrosive effects of corruption. This is the brilliance of the new policy, as it not only encourages doing compliance by mandating an operationalized compliance program, the new policy also requires companies to do more than simply operationalize compliance going forward. First, there is the presumption created, of course not guaranteed, that the company will receive a declination. This is important not only for the aggregating factors that the policy listed, but that the conduct will, will be rewarded. The carrot of the declination requires that other steps and the continuation of these steps throughout the investigation and enforcement process. Finally, as with all good quest, what will it bring you if it's actually achieved? As with the Holy Grail, it's a good story, but that's about it. 
I find this view best articulated by Matthew Stevenson in his blog post, The Irrelevance of an FCPA Compliance Defense, where he gave three reasons why a compliance defense is not warranted. First, and perhaps almost too obvious to state it, is this, that if your company is invoking a compliance defense, there has been an FCPA violation. Second, the DOJ already takes into account a company's good faith efforts to implement a meaningful compliance program when it decides whether to pursue an FCPA action against it, when what penalties and other remedies to impose. Indeed, the adequacy of a company's compliance program is a standard subject of negotiation between the DOJ and corporate defendants. Third is that an FCPA compliance defense would only alter the DOJ's bargaining position if a corporation is unhappy with the DOJ's position and can either convince DOJ lawyers that the DOJ's position is unreasonable in the light of the company's compliance program, or two, credibly threaten to go to court and defeat the DOJ's enforcement action altogether by successfully invoking the defense before the federal judge. Stevenson discounts subpart one because the DOJ lawyers already take a company's compliance program into account. But his subpart two is even more important because no company will go to trial against a government using a compliance defense only to demonstrate an FCPA violation. Simply put, no company is going to risk losing a trial when they cannot control their own fate through settlement. Modern day knights seeking the holy grail of a compliance defense will never find it because of this last fact. However, just as there were no real knights who could meet the requirements to actually find the holy grail after their quest, there are no companies which can meet the same criteria. That that being that a compliance defense could or even should trump an FCPA violation. We now leave our King Arthur exploration with our quest intact, bringing a message I hope you will have ascertained about some of the things you need to do around the nuts and bolts of compliance. I hope you've been able to look at the tales surrounding King Arthur's myths for your own inspiration in your own compliance program. This is Tom Fox. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of King Arthur, his roundtable, and compliance. And now a word about our sponsor, Converge 18, hosted by Conversant. As you know, this last year has publicly brought ethics to the center of business reputations worldwide. With the acceleration of the speak up culture and organizational accountability that social media is enabling and amplifying, companies need to incorporate integrity into every level of their organization. Converge 18 is helping organizations to do just that through the ethical transformation of leadership. The goal of Converge 18 is to arm you with information, strategy, and tactics to transform your organization going forward. Listeners to this podcast will receive a 50% discount utilizing the discount code TOMFOXVIP. That's T-O-M-F-O-X-V-I-P, all uppercase. This is Tom Fox, the Compliance Evangelist. Thanks again for joining me. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow. This has been a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.